The next part of this lecture looks at solubility product, which is a way to determine how much of an ionic compound is soluble in water. Dissolution is the process by which ionic substances dissolve in water. So we have a solid, and it breaks apart into cations and anions. Here's an example with barium acetate, which is a solid sitting at the bottom of a flask of water. Once stirring occurs, dissolution occurs. We get the barium 2 plus ion and the acetate anion. But how do you balance the equation? Where does the subscripted 2 on the barium acetate belong? It becomes the coefficient. So subscripts become coefficients. Now we have a balanced reaction. Atoms in equal atoms out. Charge in equal charge out. If we want to know how much of a material will dissolve, the equilibrium constant tells us. Let's consider sodium chloride dissolving in water. Sodium chloride is very soluble in water, but at some point, you'll reach the limit. The equilibrium constant for this is going to be sodium ion times chloride ion over sodium chloride, which, of course, you remember that solids have an activity of 1, so only the aqueous materials will be included in this equilibrium constant. So K is equal to the cation times the anion concentration. And we give this a special name. This is known as the solubility product constant, and it is an equilibrium constant for solubility. Ksp for sodium chloride is a very large value. Remember that when you have a large value for K, products are preferred. So this is an extensive reaction. And if we put a lot of sodium chloride in water, we would find many ions dissolve and only a little bit of sodium chloride remaining at the bottom. KSPs that are greater than one mean a lot of product, meaning sodium chloride solid dissolves extensively in water to make sodium plus and chloride one minus ions. What about silver chloride? Once again, the equilibrium constant would be the silver ion times the chloride ion concentration over 1. So Ksp is equal to this expression. And if you look that up in a table, at 25 degrees Celsius, this value is 1.8 times 10 to the minus 10. That is, of course, much less than 1. So what does this Ksp value mean? It means we're dealing with a non-extensive reaction. If you take a great deal of silver chloride and place it in water, you'll find that most of the silver chloride remains at the bottom, and only a few silver and chloride ions dissolve in the water. Here are some common KSPs. Silver chloride, we have already mentioned. How about silver chromate? This would be silver chromate solid dissolving to make two silver ions and one chromate ion. So remember to adjust the Ksp expression so that the silver ion is squared. Also very insoluble at 10 to the minus 12. And here are some other values. Silver sulfide, highly insoluble. Calcium sulfate, on the cusp of dissolving a reasonable amount with a Ksp of 10 to the minus 5. Let's try a calculation. Ksp of iron 3 hydroxide is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 39. This would be at room temperature. What is the maximum iron 3 concentration in solution if the hydroxide concentration is 1 times 10 to the minus 7? Those of you who know something about pH recognize that this is a solution that is neutral at pH 7. First, we need to write the compound followed by the dissolution reaction. So we will make iron 3 cation and hydroxide anion, but remember to balance your equation. There will be three hydroxide anions. 
Ksp will be equal to iron 3 plus times the hydroxide concentration cubed. All we need to do now is substitute our values. So we are substituting our Ksp here and our hydroxide concentration here. When you crunch the math, it turns out to be 1.6 times 10 to the minus 18 molar for your iron 3 concentration. So if you were trying to measure this in a lab, this would tell you something about how you could go about measuring that iron 3 concentration. You'd know that maybe you need to use a very sensitive instrument, or you need to concentrate the solution a known amount so that you can detect the iron 3 plus and then divide by the amount that you concentrated it by. Here's a concept question to see if you're following. We have the Ksp values for four mercury-1 compounds. If we put 0.1 mole of each compound in one liter of water such that it partially dissolves and reaches equilibrium, which one will have the lowest concentration of mercury-1? I'm certain many of you are wondering why I am calling this mercury-1. Remember that oxidation state is per atom, and this material, Hg2 with a 2 plus charge, is very unusual. It is two mercury cations with a covalent bond between them. That might explain why mercury has some very strange physiological effects. So if you want the lowest mercury concentration, do you want the highest Ksp or the lowest Ksp? Now is a good time to remind students of Coulomb's Law, which says the force between charges is equal to Coulomb's constant times the multiple of the charges over the dielectric constant and the distance squared. If you want to increase attractive forces, charges must also be increased. So cation and anion attractive forces are strong when Q1 and Q2 are greater than 1. Ionic solids with ions of high charge are generally insoluble. Cation and anion attractive forces are weaker when Q1 and Q2 are equal to 1, so that means ionic solids with ions of low charge are generally soluble. This is a general explanation of our solubility rules. One can also work with the denominator, and you can decrease shielding to increase the attractive force. The dielectric constant of hexane is 1 40th that of water. So hexane shields charges less than water, increasing the force between them. This would explain why sodium chloride is soluble in water, but not soluble in hexane. Hexane does a very poor job of shielding the sodium 1 plus and chloride 1 minus charges from each other. In general, ionic materials are insoluble in hexane. Here are some general definitions of solubility. Much like we generally sorted our bonds into purely covalent, polar covalent, and ionic. When ions go into solution at concentrations greater than 0.1 molar, we say they are soluble and that generally no precipitate forms. If ion concentration in solution is from 0.01 to 0.1 molar, we say it's moderately soluble. When ion concentration is less than 0.01 molar, we might call this insoluble because typically a precipitate forms. Know that insoluble does not mean none. Very tiny concentrations of lead 2 plus in water can still have physiological effects, even though lead compounds are mostly insoluble. Saturated is a term we use when the solute is at the solubility limit, meaning when there are chunks of solid in the bottom of the beaker. Like our sweet tea with sugar in the bottom, that would be a saturated solution containing sugar. Miscible would be a term for two substances soluble in one another in all proportions. 
I would use methanol in water, but I thought you might relate to rum in Coke. You may have all Coke, you may have all rum, or you may have any combination in between. These are what's known as the solubility rules, which means KSP is greater than 1 and they dissolve when placed in water. Please don't be worried that you need to memorize the solubility rules. They will be on the formula sheet that you are allowed for test 4. Your job is to apply these rules correctly. Rule number 1. Compounds of ammonium ion and 1A metal cations are soluble. You notice these are materials that have a very low positive charge, and these are all the ions that form from column 1 of the periodic table. Rule 2. Compounds of many atomed low charge polyatomic ions are soluble, meaning something with acetate, like zirconium for acetate, is soluble. These low charge polyatomics include acetate, perchlorate, chlorate, and nitrate. Rule 3. Compounds of chloride, bromide, and iodide ions are soluble, but there's an exception that precipitate. These would be when you have silver with chloride, bromide, or iodide. So silver bromide is considered insoluble. Or copper 1 plus combinations with these halides. Thallium 1 plus combinations, our strange mercury 1 compound, and lead 2 plus combinations with these anions, for example, lead 2 chloride. Why do these exceptions exist? Let's look at them on the periodic table. I trust you can see that these are metals that have high electronegativities. So when we think of the electronegativity difference between silver and chlorine, it actually falls within the range of being more like a polar covalent bond, and apparently not polar enough that it is very soluble in water. All these ions are located in a similar position where they have high electronegativities. Rule 4 finally deals with something of higher charge. Compounds of sulfate ions are soluble, but there are exceptions. Calcium, strontium, barium, and lead ions with sulfate are insoluble. Once again, let's take a look at the periodic table. You notice that calcium, strontium, and barium are all in group 2, and lead is over here. And maybe you're wondering, why isn't magnesium 2 plus part of this list? This has to do with a concept that's a bit beyond Chem 101. It's called hard and soft ions. Magnesium 2 plus is tiny and considered a hard cation. Calcium, strontium, barium, and lead are larger and therefore considered soft cations. Soft cations with our soft sulfate form a very strong attraction and make an ionic compound that is not very soluble. Our last rule is the catch-all. Most other ionic compounds are insoluble. So this might be anions like carbonate, phosphate, and even quite a few hydroxides are insoluble. Please let me remind you that the word insoluble means they precipitate. And these exceptions with sulfate precipitate, and these exceptions with the halides also precipitate. Here is a challenge question for you. Choose all the following materials that can be added to one liter of water to make a solution that is 0.3 molar in sulfate ion. This means we have to find amounts of materials in which the sulfate is 0.3 moles. So you will need to look at two different things in these solutions. First off, is it considered a soluble ionic starting material? And second, 
is it the correct amount? So go back one slide and first discount the ones in which sulfate ion is not soluble with that cation. Then start looking at the amounts. For example, in six, if we had 0.6 moles of titanium sulfate, you notice there is a two subscript next to the sulfate. So if I multiply two times 0.6, I wind up with 1.2 moles of sulfate. That's not equal to 0.3. So good luck with this brain teaser.